So everyone, we are doing movement and rhythm today. And uh, I spent the day yesterday really thinking about how I could um, help you guys out with this and show you some examples of some art projects that I've done in the past that really tie in well with movement and rhythm and then kind of why you should be teaching it or why it even matters. So I've created these little posters for you. Now if you're a sparkler, you already have this in your, um, your individual epic bundle. So if you downloaded the movement and rhythm bundle, then you have this in the, in the bundle guide. So that bundle guide is in the resource section of the bundles. But if you're not a sparkler, you don't have access to that, but I'm giving you this part. And this is a really, I love these little single page handouts because I know, I remember <laughs> really clearly that when I was an art teacher and I needed some facts about like a definition for something or an artist, a couple of little lines about an artist. For some reason, when I got up in front of students, I would be like this, just kind of winging it. And I always kind of wanted just a one pager, just to kind of, you know, quickly look at, or in the case of like the poster, have it on the, on the whiteboard and I could refer to it. Sometimes I would go into class early and just write a few things down on the whiteboard so that as I was teaching, I'd remember some key things. But that's what this little mini poster is all about. So it has a definition for movement, it has a definition for rhythm, and then a couple of examples uh, that the kids can actually see. Oh yeah, that it does look like that figure is moving so they can understand it. Then on the final page of the handout is a drawing guide for the movement fish, which is the project behind me. Now, hi, oh sorry, hi Lana, how you doing? And hi, she too. I have to get a little closer to the camera. You guys know me, my eyes are bad. So if you're a sparkler, you don't have this. I'm gonna put it in the sparklers, uh, the movement, uh, not the guide, but just the bundle under uh, this particular lesson post, the movement fish, which is in the movement and rhythm bundle, but you guys don't have this. I just created it yesterday because I really thought something's missing from this lesson. There's a video and there's lots of examples and there's a really detailed tutorial, but this is something you, you might want to have as well. So if you're not a sparkler, that's okay because my blog post has all of the details, it has this handout, and so you are golden. And now I'm going to actually show you how to do it. So in a few minutes though. Now, I love integrating art, any kind of art project with books. So I pulled a few books from my bookshelves. I pulled, pulled three, let me just get them. And I'm back. I wanted to kind of show you three books that I think illustrate uh, movement really well. Now on the blog post or in the blog post, there's a list of about nine uh, books that I really love to illustrate that whole theory of movement and rhythm. But this is one of my favorites. You probably already have this, right? Giraffes Can't Dance. It's a story of Gerald the giraffe. And this is one of the most popular lessons I think I've ever done. And I think so many other teachers have done it as well. And you know, the fun thing about this book, it was actually printed upside down. So I have to start at the back to begin the story. Isn't that cool? When I used to read this to the uh, little kids, I used to tell them that this is a super special book because I have like a funny copy. But you can see how the artist created a lot of movement just by using the actual figure to show movement, to show that the giraffe is dancing. And I'm gonna be showing you some art project samples a little later on to show you what doesn't uh, look like it's moving and what does. Hi, Emma, nice to see you. Okay, here's another book that I did not recommend in my book list, but I just happened to see it on my shelf today and I said, oh, you know, this is where line and like the other elements can work together to create movement, to create um, this pattern of your eye moving around the page. And so this is called Swirl by Swirl, Spirals in Nature. And I have never done a lesson from this, even though it would, Probably, there's just so many lovely elements to this book, but it's filled with movement. And there is a page where uh, you can see the snakes. I'm gonna move over a little bit. Uh, this, these beautiful snails and the ferns. You can just see 
uh, just by the ferns and the drawings alone, how the artist used a line to create movement, to create the viewer's eye moving across the page and around and looking really closely and deep into the details of the particular pieces of nature. So that's one way that you can actually uh, demonstrate movement in a piece of art. It doesn't have to be someone dancing like Gerald the Giraffe. Here's another book that is not on the list, but I thought it was uh, kind of a sneaky way of showing lots of things, value, color, shape, but also movement. And you can see here that these little cats, they are just uh, moving around. And one of the, uh, kind of like the vocabulary of movement, and I'll read it actually. So it says, movement is the path the viewer's eye takes through a work of art. So movement can be directed along lines, edges, shapes, and colors. So, you know, here the artist is using shape and moving it and rotating it to show a lot of movement in uh, for the cat. So they look like they're hopping all over the place. So you can kind of get the idea. So those are the three books I really like, but there's more books over on the post, so you can watch those or go over and listen to those. Now here is a uh, work of art that clearly shows movement in the waves and there's a lot of energy and you know you can almost feel at the you know being on the boat and having the boat you know undulate through the water and that's just created by using uh, you know lines and color a really popular uh, lesson i think for a lot of teachers is van gogh and children are learning about movement and rhythm the pattern and the fluidity of, of pieces of art just by using their brushstroke or by concentrating on going around a circle like you can see with the stars. And this is just a, a Van Gogh landscape that um, I think this was a teacher sample that I did you know, quite a few years ago, but you can see there's a lot of movement in the sky. So that's a really popular one to show movement. And here is something that we did for our workshop last summer, but you can see the movement just with using lines, how the, it shows that the river is flowing down and the bears are snatching onto the salmon. And children and you know, artists can feel that movement. And that's all movement is. And creating that in a work of art is something that children do naturally, you do naturally. But to be aware of it is a whole different you know, can of worms. Being aware of it really moves children along the understanding of how art is created. You know, even movement with shapes like the uh, Matisse, the eye is, you know, basically going around the work of art and your eye travels around. Now here is, uh, you wouldn't think this would be um, much movement because, you know, the planets are pretty stationary. However, your eye is following the planets around the composition. So that is a definite form of movement. Hi, Drew. And even using little uh, kind of punctuation marks uh, in your art, like this little bee, just by using these marks, it shows that the, the bee is kind of moving towards you or flying through the air. If the little marks weren't there, then it would be more static. Now here's an idea or a good example of something that's, well, let me show you this one. Keith Haring, if you've ever done a Keith Haring, this is filled with movement and rhythm. You can see that these guys are just dancing and the, the lines, the repetition of the lines shows a lot of movement. These lines down here shows that the, the figures are jumping. So you get the idea. Now, this picture is static. So the castle, this doesn't have a lot of movement in it. Uh, your eye basically just looks at the castle. It doesn't really move around the piece. And it's, you know, very uh, kind of geometric in shape. So it's, it's not a really great example of movement, just to show you that, you know, not every single work of art has movement and rhythm. And, you know, here's a project that I pulled out. It's like a scuba diver. This little scuba diver alone, if he was just on a piece of paper, it wouldn't show a lot of movement. It would be various, it would be a much, it would be a static piece. However, when you add it to this background with the, I think it goes like this, with the chalk imitating the waves of the ocean, and then you put the, the scuba diver on top, all of a sudden he's kind of moving through the murky deep, and that creates a little bit of movement in the art piece. So you can see how movement does really 
um, children can start to identify, oh, I can see how it moves and how it's not moving. So, how y'all doing? Hi, Janice, nice to see you. Okay, everyone, I think the best way to literally kind of get into the feeling of these elements of art and how you could teach these lessons to your kids is by actually doing a lesson. So I'm gonna be doing this particular lesson and I call this the movement fish. Now there's an artist that this is uh, inspired by and her name is Sandra something. <laughs> I cannot pronounce her last name. I'm not even gonna try. But if you head on over to Deep Space Sparkle, there's a link in the title of this video. Um, I have a, a little link to her Etsy, Etsy page and you can see all of the beautiful art that she creates. I think she's Canadian. Anyways, this is a great piece because it shows a lot of movement. Your eye is really moving down the page. Um, no, that's not it, Leslie. It's Switesberg or Swite something like that. Anyways, click on over. It's not a mystery. It's there. It's written down. I just, I'm just not, you know, clicking over right now to figure it out. Anyways, you can see how um, not only the fish kind of moving through the uh, through the ocean, but all of these lines are creating movement. And then there's also rhythm. So there's like a pattern. And rhythm is here's a definition. Rhythm is created when one or more elements are used repeatedly to create a feeling of movement. So they kind of work together. And rhythm creates, you know, this is very typical, creates a, a mood like music or dancing. And you can see, you know, the Keith Haring uh, dancers, that would be a lot of rhythm to that, to that project. But this one is mostly just movement, but there is some repetition here with the fish. Now, here's the breakdown. Hi, Jen, how you doing? Um, you have two choices. In the blog post, I suggest using black paint to draw. I wouldn't use a pencil, but I would also consider using, let me see, an oil pastel. You can use a black oil pastel on white paper to start the project, but then you want to finish it with black paint. The thing I love about black paint is that it really adds a beautiful painterly quality, painterly quality which means that each child they have a different way of doing it. So their projects are going to be a little bit more unique. And uh, I find that that's the best way to get kids to really loosen up. Now, you can either draw the fish with an oil pastel, which is a little neater, or you can dive right in and do it with black paint. And I'm going to show you how to do it with the oil pastel first. So, what we're going to be doing is drawing the little fish, and then we're going to be doing the background. And it looks very much like this. So this is just the beginning. So we'll draw, you know, three fish, and you can add the smaller fish if you want to. It's not necessary. I think the older the children, uh, the more challenging you want to make it, so add more fish in. The younger the children, you know, just maybe do one fish if it's for um, like a second or a third grader. But if you have like a fourth or fifth grader, use three fish and sixth or seventh grader, maybe, you know, up the ante. So I'm gonna put this here. So I have a black oil pastel, and I'm gonna start at the top. And the idea is for you to draw three fish. Now, when I told the kids, okay, go ahead and draw, you know, three fish, they're gonna say like, well, can I draw any type of fish? Can I draw, and, and you have to be careful what you say, because I said yes, and all of a sudden there were starfish, and jellyfish and I'm like not exactly what I had in mind <laughs> so I would be really specific saying yes you can draw a fish as long as it has a head and a tail and other than that I think you know you're pretty good so the way you can do this in a couple of different ways you can do a very uh, simple draw a dot and for the like the nose and then draw a curve line and stop just before you get to the end go back and don't join the line. If you do join the line, no big deal. Let's just show you, I'll show you what it looks like. So it's basically an oval, and then a line up, a line down, and then however the kids wanna connect those lines is fine. Then the way the artist, and this is a, a lesson kind of inspired by her work, what she does is draws a line through, like to separate the head from the body, and then a very straight line to the tail. And this makes the fish really kind of abstract. But I have to say, if, if all the kids did this, that would be fantastic, but they don't have to. They can make their, it their own. For instance, you can see in this particular picture, 
This is my sample, and you can even see that these fish are a little bit different. Yeah, just like that. The important thing is to draw maybe an odd number. So this time I'm going to just do a little eye in the middle, and I'm going to draw the fish going the opposite way. Just like that. Now, if you want to have some fun and you want to create even more movement in the fish itself, you can uh, really move the body around just like that. And maybe the tail goes off the page. Okay, so it's even you're creating more rhythm and more movement within the fish. And I don't think I'll add any more fish, but remember that is definitely an option for you. Now, this is a little bit dark. Let's just see if I can lighten that up a bit. Okay. Sorry guys, I just feel like it's dark and sometimes if you press it, there we go. Okay, now you, what you wanna do, you wanna draw some vertical lines throughout the artwork. You could do lines this way, but they kind of blend in a little bit more with the fish. So you wanna come down from the top and if you run into a fish, you hop over. So you keep on going, just like this. And keep on going like this and you get the idea. Now what I'll do is I'll switch this one out and I'll put this one in. I feel like I'm on a cooking show <laughs> and that's what they do. They, you know, they kind of prepare half of it and then they, they swap it out. So hopefully you guys got all that idea. Now I have, I'm ready to paint. And what I would really recommend is for you to um, kind of decide to have the fish like either a warm or cool color and the background like the opposite. So if the fish are warm, and I have some colors here, I have some red and I have some pink and you know some kind of golden yellow and then some lemon yellow. And then the background can be purple. And I think that's what I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna do the um, kind of like the warm and cool. The, the reason why you wanna do that is so that they stand out. If the kids do all different colors, like just a hodgepodge of colors, with absolutely no sense, then it's gonna look like a big jumbled mess. Now, I wanna point out something else before I move on because you might be asking, can you see all of these details? All of these, the stripes and everything? Don't draw them, don't draw them yet. That comes afterwards. The first step is to lay down the base colors. So you can see I laid down this, you know, I kinda of did a double loading technique here. I laid down a strip of red and a strip of yellow and a strip of pink and then after it dries, you can go back in and add all the details. So that's really key. Otherwise, Lord, it's a mess and you don't want that. Okay, so now I have my, a good brush and I clean it as best I can. And, okay, I'm gonna start with the yellow and I just have some tempera paint. Basically all it is is just Faber-Castell paint and it's mixed with a little bit of white. Here's the trick, guys. If you're squeezing the paints right from the tube, you're missing out for the bottle. You're missing out on some really cool colors. If you just add a little bit of white, I'm talking, you know, just if a couple of squeezes of white, everything pops. It just brightens things up. When you paint with purple paint, and then it looks really dark on the paper, but if you add a little white, look what happens. It's, it just brightens it up, makes everything a little bit more kind of um, jewel tone. Don't use so much white that it turns into a pastel. You just want it to be brightened because the colors right from the bottle are very dark. So I'm gonna start with the yellow and I'm really literally just gonna start from one side and go all the way down. And I might only complete half of this project it just depends on how long you're gonna stay with me. If you're trailing off, <laughs> then I know that you're ready to move on to dinner or, or that glass of wine. I don't know what, what you, where you're at. <laughs> okay, so you can see how I'm just kind of moving the paint along. I like to tell kids, don't worry about painting over the lines. You wanna be, uh, try to be careful as, as careful as you can. But if you go over the lines, it's, it's okay because we're gonna go back over with black paint. So it always ends a little bit messier, but we have a chance to really clean it up and that comes at the very final step. 
and usually they're pretty happy to do that. So here's some yellow. Notice how I put the yellow um, wherever I wanted on the piece of paper uh, without setting it down and moving to a new color. Uh, you take advantage of the fact that you have it in your hand, your brush is already filled with yellow, and when you're done with the yellow, then you set it down. Now I'm taking the orange. Oh, oh I think I just got, yep. <laughs> Did you guys ever do that? And then no one tells you? and you go to the grocery store after work and you have paint all over your face, that's the life of the art teacher. Okay, so now I have some orange and this is just some yellow mixed with a little bit of red, like a tiny, tiny drop because red is so powerful and it just creates this marigold color and that's what I want it to go with. And I'm just gonna put the marigold right here and it's almost, it's very similar to the yellow now that I'm thinking about it. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do the double loading technique. I have some yellow. Have you guys done this? I'm wondering, um, Lisa, have you guys done this? Like the double loading technique? I'm sure you have. If you haven't, I'm gonna do it right for you right now. Here's my brush. It's yellow. It has yellow paint on it. I'm dipping it in the red and I'm scooping it up. Look what's going to happen. I'm not brushing it off. When you brush it, oh, this red's so powerful. Usually it mixes. Just wait for it here. I'm going to do it again because I have so much red paint on my brush. I'm going to do it again. So this time I'm going to take my red brush, dip it in the yellow or that kind of marigold, and then what's happening is that the red will blend in with the yellow, with the marigold, and just create this whole new beautiful experience for the kids, a whole new beautiful color. You wanna use colors that really are blended well together. Um, like if you did red and green, clearly that's not gonna work. It'll turn like an ugly brown, but this red and yellow just work beautifully. And yeah, your little containers of paint will get messy, but it's worth the um, experience for the kids. Okay, so I can probably add a little bit more here. Okay, that was, I think that's looking pretty good. I'm gonna add some pink now. Notice how I haven't cleaned my brush yet. This is key. When you work within the same color family, you don't have to clean your brush, and the kids don't either. When they do start cleaning the brush, that's when it takes more time that's when things get a little messy and frankly that's when i kind of get in a bad mood when there's less uh water on the table the better but there's a strategy as my friend laura loman from painted paper always says start in rainbow order you know do the yellow then the orange it's not quite rainbow but yellow and red and orange and pink and and if you do it in order it doesn't matter if the colors get mixed it just adds to the artwork and she teaches that and i have been like a big big fan of that strategy as well. Certainly something that I practice with my own students. So now I have a little bit of red on my brush. I have a little bit of marigold and now I'm dipping it in pink and holy moly, I'm really liking the colors. So you can see um, it's just, all the different colors are just really working well together. Now, if you have blues and greens on your table, guess what's gonna happen? the kids are going to mix all these colors together. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm just saying that <laughs> controlling the colors of paint uh, allows children to kind of understand a little easier which colors go together a little bit better. So they won't get frustrated if their paper turns like all brown colors when they really wanted a pretty pink or a pretty red or a pretty mulberry or whatever colors that you are introducing. So here we go. And all I have is a little bit left. I'm gonna take this orange. No, I'm not. I'm gonna take, I think I'll take the red. And I still haven't cleaned my brush. Is it a hot mess? Yes, my brush and the paper, but I think it's actually super beautiful. I'm, I'm really happy with how that turned out. And remember my golden rule, 
you um, you want to model good good art behavior, and part of that is being really fearless, and liking your work and s being curious about how it evolves. And when you're excited about oh, um, like mixing the colors, and maybe it didn't work out exactly what you thought, but you're excited about it, kids will pick up on that. If you get like oh gosh, I can't believe you just mixed that together, or oh no, I didn't want to mix that. Um, kids will pick up on that energy. Now that's kind of being obvious, but I'm telling you, watch yourself because um, how you react to mistakes is basically how kids are going to react. And you can really model amazing behavior for little young artists about how fearless they can be in the art room. Like this should be a safe place for them. Okay, so now I'm going to start painting the fish and I'm going to start with my lightest blue, which is this pretty blue. Now this is just a cobalt blue, but I add it Okay, do you guys want to see what I just did? I don't think I'll be using any more yellow. Yeah, so when I'm, <laughs> that's what happens, but guess what? When I mix this together, it's gonna to be really pretty green, so I'll probably do that. But right now I have this cobalt blue mixed with a little bit of um, white, and I won't tip it as far next time. And I'm gonna just paint. Now you don't have to paint the whole, your whole fish one color. You can really, you know, like the background, decide where you want to put that pretty blue. I think I'll put another one down here. This is starting to flop. You'll notice as you're painting, your paper has a tendency to flop a little bit. So I'm going to need a little bit more reinforcement with my magnets. Okay, so now I'm back to the races. Off to the races. <laughs> Okay, that looks pretty good. Maybe I'll do his tail. So here I'm using color to create movement. So I'm picking places within the piece of art to move one particular color around. And your eye truly does follow that. Okay, so remember that yellow that I accidentally mixed with the blue? Um, okay, so I'm gonna mix it. And ooh, I got this really pretty green. Can you see it? Uh, I don't wanna do it too close, otherwise it's gonna go all over the place. It's not quite blue enough for the background, but I'm gonna add it in some little details. Ooh, I really like that green. It's, it's pretty much a lime green. That came certainly by accident. I like it so much, I'm putting it here. And I think that's good enough. Okay, now I'm moving to a darker blue, I'm not cleaning my brush. And this is more of a turquoise blue. And because I have the yellow, and a little bit of the green, it's really looking kind of cool. Okay. This is pretty. It's almost like I'm doing the double loaded painting technique on every single, you know, one. And now that I have introduced the green, I probably won't introduce the purple. I was going to introduce purple, but I think it'll be too much. So now I'm going to do this little head. And again, you, I'll show you up close what this painting looks like because it really is messy. Uh, but I don't want you to worry about that because what will happen is that when the painting dries, the children will have an opportunity to paint over it. And that's when, that's when all the beautiful things happen. So the most important part of this process, and this is what you should watch out for as the teacher, our children kind of understanding, number one, the drawing, creating movement, and creating things that are not too busy so that they can paint uh, inside. And then our children um, taking nice risks with their colors. And are they creating um, like colors that go together? Do they understand that the yellow, the red, the orange kind of belong in that family? And that the, the blues, they want to stand out a little bit more. Now this little guy right here is not standing out a lot, especially I can see that on the camera. And that's because this green that I kind of created, it's not that dark, but I wanted to use it anyways, and I think it's going to work. Now the next step is literally the decorations, and we're going, we're going for it. I'm going to uh, put my magnets on here. The beautiful thing about painting, uh, doing the outlining with black paint, literally means that you can still you can do the outlining when the painting is still wet or just tacky dry so if you're a studio owner 
and uh, you, you have a kids for an hour, this is a great lesson to do. If you're in the classroom and you have like 30 minute sessions, you would only do some of the, you would do the drawing one day, you would do the main painting the second day, and then on the third day, you would do the black painting. So this, uh, you almost always wanna start with the fish, and I'm just gonna go around here. I'm using a, a brush uh, that looks like, so this is what I paint it with, and this is the brush that I'm using for the black. You can see that it's much smaller. If you use a brush like this, um, it takes a lot longer. You're gonna get a fine line, a better line, but it requires more uh, dips in the paint tin. This is good for the details like around the eyes, but for the big, big bold lines, like the bodies, you wanna go all the way around with this that it holds a lot of paint so just like that now you might be asking uh, what is this paint basically it's liquid tempura paint and i'm using the faber castell and it's mixed with just a little bit of water just enough so that it just feels like kind of heavy cream and that looks pretty good. I'm gonna do this fish. And this is also where the understanding of movement comes from. You really want to emphasize these black lines so that they really show that the fish are moving through this beautiful orange sea. Okay, so that's it for the fish. I want to see if you guys have any questions. Um, so Marissa, it looks like she's here answering questions. Thanks, Marissa. Okay, so now I'm going to just do some more details and now i'm going through the background now there's more to the background than just meets the eye this is where we can get into a lot more detail if you're teaching third grade students this might be where you kind of stop uh, just doing this background line but if you're teaching older students they're going to want the opportunity to add far more details and you can and I'm gonna point out a few details for you. Just hold on, I'm gonna keep on doing this. This is the part of the project I love the most. The reason why I love it, it, it takes like this painting that literally looks like a hot mess and it makes it sharp, it makes it, you know, tell a story. You can see the beautiful shapes. The colors are, are just so vibrant against the black. Uh, this is where all the details happen and it's where all the kids can kind of infuse their personality Which is the key. I'm going to switch over to the little brush now if I showed you I'm going to show you some opportunities here. So you don't just have to do it as simple. You can really go into detail Can you see how I, I put different lines here and I made dots so you can literally take some paint and paint over a dry area of what are the back stripes or even the fish with some uh, regular tempera paint. Or you could use oil pastels. Think of the possibilities of using metallic oil pastels in that, you know, when that all dries. I wouldn't go um, grabbing the oil pastels until like literally the next day when it's nice and dry. Otherwise, you're gonna ruin the pastels. Definitely don't use Sharpies until paints are absolutely bone, bone dry. But look at all the details that you can create using the little tiny brush, and you can create checkerboards, you can create little circles, you can take metallic paints and add little details to the, the fish, which is what I love the most. Um, but at the very least, take a small brush, and this time you're adding the details. And uh, this is where you can add the details to the fish. You can look at the artist's inspiration for you know extra details because boy she really goes to town and this is the style she she uses too she really outlines with black and she adds a lot of patterns to her fish really makes everything stand out 
Um, I'm going to do a lot of really close stripes here. And if you remember, the last session four, the last session we did on contrast and emphasis, this is really adding a lot of contrast to the art and you're emphasizing the fish shapes. And if you use a little contour lines, you're emphasizing the body. So I don't really think kids need to know all that, but you know, isn't it great to know that you're doing all of these wonderful things in one lesson? So, you know, administrators, when you, they see you incorporating all of these beautiful elements, you know, gosh, the children are just so lucky to have you. Okay, this goes way beyond whipping out a worksheet and, and some crayons, right? I mean, you're really doing some great stuff. Okay, I just love this project. I could just kind of sit here and do it all day. Now the background, so you can like, again, enhance the fish however you want, but the background's where you can really have some fun. You can use oil pastels, um, but you can also create patterns within the background, just like this. And you could, you know, even do wiggly ones. So again, creating more movement. Perhaps your eye is traveling, following this wiggly line. So you guys get the idea. I hope this has been like a fun lesson. I'm kind of wondering. Uh, so Cynthia says, can we access your previous lessons online in contrast? Yes. So number one, the website Deep Space Sparkle has all of the the previous Facebook Live posts and lessons. So all you need to do is go to www.deepspacesparkle.com and if you click Art Library in the menu bar, it will populate the whole page with all of our most recent lessons. And you'll see all of the elements of art and principle of design, what we call the epic curriculum. You'll see line and pattern, you'll see shape, color, contrast and emphasis and then you'll see this one too now so you can watch it through the web or if you go to uh, my deep space sparkle facebook page which is where you are right now right on the sidebar there is a um i guess it's this side there's like a video section if you click on the video section you'll see all the videos that we've created in the facebook lives and you can still download all the, all the downloads, I tell you. There's like a bunch of stuff there. Okay, everyone, you guys have a great day, and I'll see you next week, okay? See ya.